the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have... On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, screenwriter of the sci-fi hit Arrival, Eric Heiserer. I had devoured about half the book, and I had to stop at Story of Your Life because it emotionally wrecked me. Like, I had this um, weird mix of just, like, feeling uplifted and hopeful and also completely shattered. Uh, and just put it down and went out and hugged everybody within walking distance <laughs> and just was like, wow. And then sat back down and I thought, how can I torture a greater audience with this? In this episode, Eric Heiserer talks about working with director Denis Villeneuve and the challenges of writing a cerebral sci-fi story about love and loss. Memory is a strange thing. It doesn't work like I thought it did. We are so bound by time, by its order. Come back to me. I remember moments in the middle. I love you. I hate you! And this was the end. Did he come back to me? But now I'm not so sure I believe in beginnings and endings. There are days that define your story beyond your life, like the day they arrived. What I love about this opening here is that not only is it beginnings or endings and endings or beginnings, but it also kind of conjures up that notion that the past is prologue. And so you really set us up to feel that this has happened, and now I'm going to tell you a story. I knew that I wanted to make this first and foremost um, a, um, a story about Louise and about this relationship to her daughter, um, and that the 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 second tier is the is the visitation uh and i also didn't want to build the story as um you know like a usual suspects kaiser soze reveal of aha now the magic trick i and i wanted to be able to tell the audience the entire story in the first few minutes or in the first uh, you know couple of pages uh and at least the emotional part of it uh so uh so everyone was on board with that yeah. I was wondering, the voiceover seems extremely specific. It's one of the few times where I, when I was looking at this, I feel like the words were very, very carefully chosen. I did. I got, I got very specific and, and made sure that everybody understood why those words were so important. It's, it's, it's easier when your film is about language and communication to be picky about those things. I've tried to be like that in other movies, and they're like, shut up, writer. <laughs> like, calm down, Shakespeare. You know, like I've I've gotten that from everybody else, but but here, especially with uh, the the producers, uh, the Dan's, they were they were very attentive, and they're like, yeah, we get it, and they just they just plugged into it right away and understood what we were trying to accomplish. Well, I had uh, 
I had bumped into Ted Chang um, online. Uh, a friend sent me a link to a story that was published in its entirety on an online uh, uh, science fiction zine, uh, and it was the story Understand. Uh, and I devoured that, and my mind was blown away at the end of it. I thought, this guy can write. Oh, my God. What else has he done? Uh, and discovered the, the collection, Stories of Your Life, uh, on, uh, on Amazon, and I just instant buy it, you know. Uh, probably is procrastination from writing on something. I was just like, I'll do this instead. Um, and then a few days later, it shows up at my, uh, at my door. And uh, once again, to, pr to procrastinate, I was like, I'll just read a story. I've done a page. That's good. <laughs> and, uh, and then like a few hours later, I had devoured about half the book. And I had to stop at Story of Your Life because it emotionally wrecked me. Like I had this um, weird mix of just like feeling uplifted and hopeful and also completely shattered. Uh, and just put it down and went out and hugged everybody within walking distance <laughs> and just was like, wow. And then sat back down and I thought, how can I torture a greater audience with this? How can I infect a bunch of people with this feeling? Um, and it was that drive that really continued to um, sort of uh, fund my, my desire to make the, make the short into a film, just to, to capture the feeling and, and broadcast that to more people. I've had a bunch of very stressful pitches in my career, but none as stressful as like, <laughs> Ted, I'm gonna, I'm gonna race, basically I'm gonna take your kid away for a year and he's gonna come back, he's gonna probably learn some curse words and have a different haircut. <laughs> Please let me have him. Um, and, but thankfully he was like, this, this is interesting. I don't know if it can be a movie, but I'm curious to see if it'll work. And, and he gave me the green light and then off we went. Denis was the most enriching uh, relationship that I've had with uh, a director in my career so far. Um, and he just he behaved very differently from anybody else that I've been in the room with. I've been so accustomed to getting to a point where a director is attached or, or thinking about becoming attached. And, uh, and it's a very brief meeting where, you know, often the director will get my name wrong. And, and not really, not like, it's like, look, this is the last time I'm going to see you, maybe before the premiere. So, uh, so and then off they go. And, uh, and maybe, you know, the, in the arbitration, there are four other names on it at that point. Uh, so with Denis, though, he got interested, and everybody, all the independent financiers and my producers were all like, oh, my God, prisoners on Sandy's. Dude, this, this, can, this is a go movie if we get him. And no pressure, Eric, but don't mess this up. <laughs> And, uh, and he offered, and so we had a, 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 a breakfast meeting at a little spot near his hotel in, uh, in Westwood and sat down. And it wasn't like a little half hour session at all. It went, it went on for like a couple of hours. And we just did a deep dive on philosophy and science and religion and geopolitics and would occasionally steer back to the script and he'd have some questions. Uh, and at the end of it, we, you know, he got up, he shook hands. He says, like, Eric, this was nice. Let's do this next week. <laughs> and I was like, sure, OK, yeah, great. And we kept doing that for six or seven weeks. Um, and he, and he, he just he inspired me. He would get me excited about something because I discovered he was a, he's a fetishist on process. He loves kind of getting into how does this really work? You know, and would there be paperwork for them to sign? Why don't we include a scene with them signing paperwork? And I'm like, no other director would want this. I love that you do. Yes, and uh, and we just you know we reached out to different people in the uh, in sort of a, in a, in, the, in that community and in NASA and learned that there's actually an actual protocol uh, in the Pentagon, some binder with a bunch of names on the front of it that we nicknamed the Nerd Avengers that would call, get called in case there was some sort of like a uh, uh, first contact situation. And, and we then learned about little details of, uh, to make sure that things kept from being irradiated. There would be like a, a strange little shower system for trucks and other vehicles. And he's like, I like this. I am, I deeply love this. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, this is in the movie, Eric. Um, and it just kept going. So I would write pages for him sometimes during this time, and I'd come back to him. And it was a lovely little show and tell. Um, but every week, my, my, my producer's like, please, dear God, say he's on board. Like, no, but we had, a, we had a, like a croissant and a mocha, and we talked about politics. It was great. And he's like, what the hell are you doing, Eric? 
Um, and then finally, after all that time, I got a call from my agent like, holy crap, dude, you, it finally worked. He's on board. It's official. And then a minute later, Denis called me himself, and, and he says, all right, Eric, now we are married. This is a great example of how collaborating with fellow artists can make your movie better. Uh, because in early drafts, I had it sort of a sort of a perfunctory entry of they would they would go into a, a spherical ship and an iris would close behind them and they started just talking to the uh, aliens right away because um, I had kind of had too much of Ted's story in my uh, in my system at that point and uh, I also wanted to get to get right to it. But after working with the knee on it, he kept coming back to try and making that much more of a, of a, of a process, much more of a, an earthly feeling and a long approach. And he talked about shifting the gravity and, uh, and extending out this period of time. Uh, and before I sat down with him to talk about how to alter this sequence, I was set aside by um, the financiers that said, okay, Eric, your job is to convince him not to do this because this is going to make the movie longer and more expensive. Like, we don't have budget for what he's talking about, so just go in and just defend your script that we love. Uh, and I sat down with him, and I was like, all right, Denis, gravity, let's do this. <laughs> um, and I, I was a total saboteur against the, uh, against the financiers. And, and it was in that process when both of us got to the point of Louise first approaching the, the, the heptapods, uh, after Denis had come up with this amazing stuff of like the glow stick and all the stuff of the gravity shift and our one f bomb in the movie for for Rinner. Uh and uh, and then we, when we got to that moment, I, I looked at it and I'm like, you know, intellectually she understands what she's there for. Intellectually, she's been told there are aliens and you know she's in a spaceship. But at this point in time, I think the most human reaction would be her to just to just blank, just go like, oh my God, I'm standing in front of an extraterrestrial and and just, you know, blue screen of death. So he got very excited about the idea of cutting away and and just having a breakdown uh, in the room there and have to come up with another way of doing it. And that led us again to other story ports. Like one, one great idea can unlock others. There's a great little ripple effect of when she's then in the moment right after that, uh, you know, when poor, when poor Ian is throwing up in the trash bin, and she's thinking she's gonna get fired. I said, it would be great if Weber says, you did much better than the last guy. Am I fired? You're better than the last guy. That doesn't make me feel any better. And he's like, yes, we will have someone on Medivac go all out, you know, out as she goes in. And that's the last. I'm like, okay, great, let's do this. And then we came back to that, and the, and the financiers are like, Eric, what did we tell you? What is, what is this? There are four new scenes now, you know. <laughs> When did you discover you could use the tools of cinematic language, specifically of flashbacks, to your storytelling advantage? I started with that idea having looked at the way that Ted framed his story. You know, he played with tense, and I realized that to do this, I needed to play with time. Uh, it's such a key element of, of the way the, the story has to unravel. Uh, it, it is just a matter of making sure that those time fugues, those little moments made sense in the logic of the film. Uh, in Ted's story, he just drops you right into this process and the entire story goes back and forth very early on before you, before you know that, you know, that this is coming. And Denis and I both agreed uh, that the, the way to tell this cinematically is to have it start like a trickle once she started cracking the language and get more and more um, 
I guess, not necessarily intense, but get more frequent and get longer. And more than anything, show her self-awareness of it happening in both timelines instead of just in the in the one in our present one, so to speak. I feel like I'm with Louise, or I'm getting sucked out in the timeline in this very lyrical way. So, again, can you tell us how you all collaborated to make to make that work and have it be very visually different? And again, but part of this whole world. Uh, we we had so many really fun and enriching ideas tackling this story and tackling the relationship that Louise had with Hannah and uncontextualizing the flashback or flash forward moments. Uh, <clears throat> but it continued to make the script a little bit longer or sometimes it would just confuse our, our, our readers uh, on the financing side uh, because they wouldn't necessarily understand why we're suddenly in a horse ranch and uh, and Hannah is petting a horse. They, they're like, I don't understand. So I would insert language there, like the line that was there to to appease those readers were um, Louise to Hannah saying, see, they're not so different than you or I. And it just came out of her, her in another heptapod session so that I could help the reader tie those things together. Um, and then once that went out, I, I sat down with Denny, I'm like, you know, you, you don't need that line. You got Bradford. I mean, it's going to be amazing. And he's like, it's OK. It's OK. Uh, and, and sure enough, like you end up with something that's very impressionistic. Um, and I love the way that they use focus uh, to try and create interesting shapes in that space. Um, uh, and how it was an interesting um, conversation with the, a visual effects team that does not like stuff out of focus because all their visual effects work, then you can't see all the time and energy they put into it. But we, we, needed, to, we needed to do that a lot with the heptapods so that it matched in a lot of the other shapes. Even in the opening sequence, there was a moment, the reason why we picked little Hannah to have a horse and whatnot is that when we go out of focus, it looks like she has more limbs. I will never forget what you said. You told me my wife's dying words. Xiangjun. One of the biggest changes from the short story was to introduce um, a larger conflict and, and something that would continue to escalate throughout the film uh, because the the short story in all its poetry and uh, and its emotion and, and its uh, its deep thought really has no uh, central conflict. Um, the uh, the heptapods uh, sort of deliver um, TV screens really throughout the world that uh, allow you to remotely talk to them via very expensive Skype call, and uh, and that stays for about six months until one day they're like, okay, we're done, and they're gone. And so there's no sense of like, you know, a looming ship. There's, who knows where they're actually talking from. And, and, and none of the governments are, are really at each other's throats. Uh, so uh, the, the question was really to find a way to create a possible antagonist in the film and then reveal that they aren't the antagonist uh, in the way that the aliens weren't either. Communications blackout from all 12 landing sites continues this evening. The two questions Hold on, on we mind. are just hearing. And I'm being told we're going to cut yes, this report this to tell you breaking, breaking news. now. China has called an China emergency press to... conference. General Shang, commander in chief of the People's Liberation Army, has announced in an emergency press conference that China is standing down. China is standing there was a line that was in there for a while that um, that, uh, that that somebody decided was was a a, 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 too, a little too precious, and it was talking about from General Shang's POV, the Americans were the aggressors that were about to ruin this whole thing because they're the ones that blew up a ship or like, you know, detonated something inside the ship. And, uh, and, and it was a, a fascinating way of saying, uh, you know, that we all end up vilifying the other country, you know, in our, in our, in our sort of our national storytelling. Uh, 
the the scene there though was incredibly difficult simply because we skirted so close to paradox and you know i talked a little bit earlier about john rogers saying that exposition is really sort of best done as an argument and it came to life for me in a conference room in Montreal with two physicists yelling at the top of their lungs about what could and couldn't be done right there. And using using terms that just went right over my head, but some fascinating ones that I hung on to, like time soup. I, I don't know what that is, but uh, I'm starting to get hungry. <laughs> and um, and ultimately, we, we landed on this with a handful of other bits of information that we that were that were were in a uh, version of the script, and then that were also shot, but uh, didn't always make make it to the final film, which is um, a frustrating thing for actually for all of us who who work so hard to try and make sure that everything was airtight. You never want to say, "Well, off screen, we answer that in something that you never saw," because that that feels like a bit of a cheat. But like it. It did finally work for everybody, and the intercutting was something that our editor uh, uh, zeroed in on. Our early versions of it didn't have an intercut as much, and we found it was a much better way to to ratchet up the tension. Um, and 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 ultimately, like I think all of us were fairly satisfied with the final version of the scene, even though it, it changed a lot from the earlier versions. And of course, the movie came out, and we got a bunch of uh, one star reviews. Like she saves the world with a phone call. You know, like they didn't, they did not like that. They really, they really wanted something blown up. Stick him up. <laughs> Are you the sheriff in this here town? These are my tickle guns and I'm gonna get you. You want me to chase you? You better run. <laughs> I wrote a bunch of the the uh, little scenes with uh, Louise and Hannah first because they were really important to me, and I wanted to make sure the emotion was there. Uh, and so um, I did a whole bunch of them, far more than I knew I'd ever want in the script. Um, and then by the time we got to the shooting draft, I I went back to Denis and I said, "Here's here's just two more. Just see, just try and get the, just a little more, just in case. Uh, you know, see if you have a way to shoot a few more scenes." And uh, and that was really the thing that I focused on most. I knew that like, if we ever got too deep into the science of the, the present storyline, uh, that was a lot of linguistics and it was a lot of math, a lot of Jeremy Renner scenes that never made it poor Jeremy Renner. Like we had so much fun stuff. He, he once explained Fermat's principle of least time using a, a hand sanitizer and a, and a laser pointer. It was a great scene, and, and everyone was like, Eric, this is not a TED talk. <laughs> what do you, just get this out. Um, but but the, the emotional scenes were really important, and, and there, were, uh, there were a couple that actually were shot that really couldn't fit into the film simply because you had to be so careful to make sure that the context of it was right, you understood the impetus for why it would go to that moment, um, and what would bring her back out. And, uh, and, and sometimes it could break the film, there was a scene that we had that was in the middle for a long time uh, that was an extension of the moment of young Hannah saying, I hate you. And it was really, she was getting grounded to show that like a mom and daughter didn't always get along. Um, and uh, and she, she's stomping up to her room. The last thing she says to, to Louise is, why don't you just let me live my own life? And we stayed on Amy Adams there who, and it made the most amazing performance because you could see her deciding, I'm going to have you regardless. That's the moment that she makes the decision, knowing what's coming. Um, and if you don't know the reveal, you're in the middle of the movie, and you see that and you're like, why are they, what the, what was that about? Like, I don't understand. And if you know the reveal, you get to that point, and you're like, oh my God, and it's, you're a wreck, and you really can't recover from that. Did you ever see the heptapod language as the metaphor for you trying to tell the story, knowing the end, knowing the beginning, and should know the middle, but it's really hard to get there. My wife was observant enough to like point that out several times. And of course it was the most, I was the most frustrated. I was like, shut up, don't tell me that. <laughs> yes, it's a metaphor, I get it. Uh, but it was, it was still incredibly frustrating uh, to figure out the, uh, the midpoint of this, of this film. But, you know, figuring a, a way that, that made sense of how everything could escalate. Um, early on in the development felt really, really hard 
to bite off. It felt like we were being a bit too arch with geopolitics. Uh, and yet the closer we got to film time, the more we we're like, no, this is, this feels more like you know, people just don't want to trust each other. And, <laughs> and of course they would start shutting off communication. And, and, and so it, it felt a little more real. Uh, it felt good knowing that we could, we could at least stick the landing if we could get there. You've been watching a conversation with Eric Heiserer. On On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.